I guess let's jump into like kind of the main topic of conversation, which is sex trafficking. Um, the kind of mounting uh, press around the sex trafficking issue has really seen a spike, I think, in the last year. I think just like generally a lot of things have seen a spike in the last year because of the the state of um, the world right now, really, with the pandemic and politics and everything like that. So we're seeing and hearing a lot more about it. And there seems to be this belief that there's this like absolutely enormous child sex trafficking issue that we need to overcome. And, you know, I just want to say, first of all, obviously sex trafficking exists. Sex trafficking is terrible. Sex trafficking children is fucking terrible. Nobody um, believes otherwise, but I think that there is, it's, it's been hyped up in a way that is far beyond where, what the problem actually is. So could you maybe explain that and, and, and why you think we got to this place and your thoughts on just how this all came about? Yeah, this actually, you know, all started, you know, more than, than two decades ago when, you know, the, the porn wars, the sort of anti-porn feminists of the 80s and 90s, the, you know, Andrea Dworkins and Catherine McGinnis Kinnan gang, you know, they really sort of uh, teamed up with the religious right uh, on anti-porn things. And after that, I mean, after that was sort of dying down, both because they got some things with the internet passed, but mostly it was just like not going anywhere, they realized. Uh, they decided to sort of team up on prostitution. And there's actually sort of, you know, documented evidence of these groups, these uh, rad femme groups and these religious conservatives or social conservative groups coming together and saying like, how do we now start opposing prostitution and polls back then showed, you know, Americans weren't really that opposed to it actually if it involved consenting adults. And so they're, they deliberately sort of set out to reframe all prostitution as sex trafficking, or at least muddy the waters enough that people, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't know the difference. And it's remarkable to see these things from like 1999 and 2000 saying that, and now two decades later, just see that fully be the case. You know, you'll, you'll look at, um, police reports, you'll look at media covering police reports, you'll look at activists talking about this issue. And I mean, so many of them don't even make any difference. Like you said, between, you know, the things we don't want, which are underage people doing it and people doing it under force and coercion and between adults choosing to do sex work of, of various sorts, you know? So there's just been so much conflation. And I think, you know, a lot of it has been deliberate, um, as a, as an activist tactic, or because politicians then latch onto this issue and realize that if they just sort of invoke sex trafficking, that they can pass whatever laws that they want saying anything. Um, but I think, you know, there's obviously a lot of well-intentioned people too, who, you know, hear about this and they hear these crazy statistics that are, you know, um, we'll talk about that I think in a second, but, you know, they hear these crazy things and they think, okay, I want to get involved in health. And it's just sort of really spiraled out of control now where, yeah, people think that there's this, epidemic of sex trafficking and, you know, kids are being sold on Wayfair, the, the furniture website and things like that. And it's just, yeah, it's really taken on a crazy life of its own, this sort of moral panic proportions. Yeah. I mean, because as the, as like, we're kind of progressing socially, you know, and obviously there's a big movement in the adult industry about decriminalizing sex work and, and just a, a cohesion among all these different players in, um, within the sex industry, because, you know, back, I don't know, 10 years ago, there was a huge difference in everyone's mind between a porn star and a prostitute. And there was a lot of like throwing stones, you know, and if you were a porn star, you were better than a prostitute. And a lot of porn stars wouldn't work with girls who escorted on the side. And there was a big stigma around it. And now there's been a lot of um, the community coming coming together, and I think social media has a lot to do with that, and recognizing, hey, we're all sex workers, and by us, you know, pointing fingers at each other and saying, well, my kind of sex work is bad, but your kind of sex work, I mean, sorry, my kind of sex work is good, your kind of sex work is bad, we're really um, just dividing ourselves, so let's come together and let's really present this unified front. So even the idea of prostitution, which, you know, used to always be and still is, let's be fair, this, this idea of this, this dirty forced, um, 
industry and you have more and more women that are coming out and willingly speaking about like, yes, I do escorting. I'm a companion. Um, I work at the bunny ranch. I've had a few of those girls in my podcast and they've spoken very intelligently about their very intentional choice to be in this line of work and how they really enjoy it. So it feels like that term, like let's save the prostitutes isn't going to work anymore, but sex trafficking, that's a good word because that alone, the trafficking suggests that all of these people are being pushed into something that they don't want to do. And so that feels like something that like everybody can get behind, including the conservatives and liberals. And like you said, a lot of well-intentioned people. Yeah. And like you said, it also, it can, it can reach into anything too, because then they can say, well, sex trafficking doesn't just happen in prostitution. You know, people are trafficking in the porn industry. People are trafficking in strip clubs. People are trafficking into all these different forms of sex work. So, yeah, mm -hmm. it really sort of provides this, like, all-purpose excuse for, you know, police to sort of um, monitor and, and do things on, on all sorts of topics that are, like, in the adult entertainment industry or related to sex. Yeah. And the first time I really saw that affect us as an industry when the 2257 laws came into place... 15, 20 years ago. And, you know, Sorry, so, know. so actually the 20, so the 2057 law is this requirement that, and there's, I, I know there's more to this, but kind of like, we kind of basically call it that. So it's age verification, right? Okay. Yeah. But, but essentially what, what we used to be able to do is uh, models used to fly in from Europe all the time to shoot in other countries, right? And they instituted this law that required that any people who engage in explicit sex work, so explicit porn, in the U.S. must have two U.S.-issued government IDs. So you could no longer come in from, you know, Eastern Europe and work here anymore um, in the way that you could before. And, you know, the whole premise behind that was we're preventing sex trafficking. So again, it was this idea that these girls from Europe are being flown into the U.S. to shoot porn unwillingly. And I can, you know, tell you just from, and look, the, it, porn is many different things. There's smaller underground companies, there's amateur porn, like, you know, there's the above board mainstream porn, what we call it, which is what I work in. And then there's the more like seedy underbelly, but that underbelly doesn't really exist in the way that people think it does. But like the idea that a lot of girls in porn are being like sex trafficked, I can just tell you, it's like, just not true. <laughs> You know what I mean? There's so many girls that, that, that actively want to work in the industry and that, I mean, there's too many girls, you know what I mean? We're at the point now where we're like flooded. Like we are not trying to steal girls from Czechoslovakia <laughs> to come here and unwillingly work in porn, you know, like they come with, it's just like, it's just, but, that's not true. But that's, you know, it's crazy. And so this is maybe like a little bit of a, a digression, but something I've written about too is how this is sort of, I mean, and, a long time thing. Like this is one of the earliest, this is one of the ways that the US government has long time controlled immigration and borders was through the prospect of, of sex trafficking or sex workers. Like I, I, like probably the, like the earliest um, immigration law was because they were trying to stop like Chinese prostitutes from coming in, they said. And so like, yeah, there's just been this long history of sort of using this idea. And, and then this sort of back then, like in the Victorian era, there's this whole panic over trafficking too. Um, and, th and that started this whole sort of immigration crackdown. So it's just interesting to see like that morph into so many different forms over the years, but yeah, it's sort of using it to like control people. Think. Yeah. And then the next, I think big, um, step in terms of the, the law using that excuse to crack down on sex work is SESTA FOSTA which a lot of people, um, again, if you're not in the industry, are not entirely familiar with. So could you explain that in its kind of basic terms, what that is and, and what that meant for the industry? Yeah, basically FOSTA, it did two, SESTA FOSTA did two things. It, um, it made it a federal crime with a mandatory minimum of, I think, 10 years in prison to host online ads for sex or prostitution that wound up, uh, you know, it, um, yeah, that wound up causing harm in any way. And also then I'm sort of doing a bad job explaining this. Um, sorry. 
It's okay. But also, um, it also changed the federal law called Section 230, which applies to the internet and says that websites aren't liable if you know users post things that end up causing them harm. So again, you know, if someone posted an ad back on uh, back page back when it existed, or Craigslist, or you know, um, that, those are the ones that are sort of always demonized in, in the popular press. So they would say, you know, people are posting ads there, and then they meet up with people, and then they get you know abducted or raped or they get trafficked or things like that. And we want to be able to hold those websites liable. So it was about, you know, theoretically, it was about holding those websites liable, even though there are already rules in place where if those websites were doing it knowingly, they could be in trouble. Um, in effect, I think what, you know, the big, the big thing that people have seen was that it wasn't really about actually, you know, prosecutors wanting to use it and actually, and even though they are, they are starting to use it, but it wasn't so much about that. It was about making websites afraid because the punishments were so bad if they break this law. So like any talk of sex, you know, that what if it ended up, you know, resulting in some sort of harm or someone being underage being involved and then they could, you know, be sued out of existence. So you started to really see, you know, Craigslist shut its, um, you know, dating and, and casual encounters ads. You saw other people start to just crack down and, and you know, um, reject sex worker ads and reject sex worker accounts more generally on social media. And I think we've seen that only um, pick up since FOSTA has been used, even though nobody has been convicted under the law um, yet. But it's just, you know, the threat of it is so big that it's, you know, really in effect just made social media and the internet at large really crack down on sex-related content of all sorts. The key thing, too, is that, yeah, anything that is seen to facilitate prostitution or promote prostitution, not just sex trafficking, is now, if, you know, hosting that is now a federal crime. So like you said, like anything where if sex workers are talking about how to keep each other safe, well, is that them, you know, promoting prostitution? Is the website or the app that hosts that then, are they promoting prostitution by, you know, giving sex workers a means to talk about it? So, yeah, like you said, like any of these things that help keep people safe when they're doing this and help people screen clients and, and sort of communicate amongst themselves could be seen as being against the law. And nobody knows, you know, if that would then mean that it's illegal under false. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, make sure that you subscribe so you don't miss a single episode and go check out all the other videos. I film every single one of my podcasts. And if you want to listen to the audio version, I'm on iTunes and all the other podcast platforms. Visit hollyrandallunfiltered.com to find out more.